Hello everyone, I'm Jim Sin Lee for SpeedEndurance.com and BudWinter.com. In September of 2011, I had the chance to meet with Ernie Bullard near his home in Stockton, California. Now, Ernie Bullard spent 16 years at San Jose State University from 1968 until 1984. The first two years as the assistant coach to Bud Winter and then 14 years as the head coach. Afterwards, he spent eight years at USC. Now, in the interview, we were in a restaurant, so you'll hear a lot of dishes and cutlery that's banging around. But otherwise, it was a great talk, and I hope you enjoy it. But, uh, Bud Winter obviously was avant-garde when it came to mechanics of sprinting and preparing sprinters to run fast. Uh, Avant-garde, I mean that he didn't have a lesson plan to follow. He observed and watched and analyzed, and he noticed certain things that in some cases he labeled as causes, but were actually symptoms of other things happening. And that's what avant-garde means. You may have the definition not exactly right, but you're seeing things other people aren't seeing. For example, uh, thinking obviously the two factors in running fast is stride frequency and stride length. Mm -hmm. And there's that optimum you have to find for the average sprinter. Whereas Bud looked at the longer stride coming from a four leg reach where, and he also was intrigued by the fact that the great sprinters on the back kick the foot was up near the hips. Right. And he noticed that and was curious about it but kind of went away from it. And, and, and today, most of with the technology that we have that he didn't have, he's observing and analyzing. Uh, you're, the reason there's high knees isn't what you do in front, it's because the foot is high in the back, and as you pull the foot through, the knee is high. Mm -hmm. So the high knees came from the extension not reaching out. It, it, it's the extension of the leg. Uh, again, uh, but he was ingenious in the fact he knew the stride length could be increased and he was curious about the high foot at the back and he was in the process of kind of trying to fit that together. Today with pressure plates and all kinds of analytical tools, uh, you know, that's a little further along. but. Uh, he definitely was the Galileo of his time. I mean, he had it. He had it right. No, definitely. I know um, John had some questions. If okay, certainly. Um, I guess the first question, I about five questions, was uh, for his sprint group and middle distance group. Yeah. Uh, can you go over what sequence he did the workout for everybody? Did they all train together, and from the warm up to the drills to the runs to the well, killer dillers? Yeah, with with some of the kids we. Had. Kids, I call them kids. Hell, they're almost my age today. Uh, uh, just getting those guys out there and keeping track of them and getting past all the talking. Uh, that was probably as much uh, a factor as it. it wasn't quite like it. coaching from the middle, early 60s on got more complicated with sprinters than it was before then. Now, Tommy was there and he. Uh, Tommy was quiet and he was a good listener and Tommy was serious. Uh, and Lee Evans was serious. Uh, John Carlos was serious when it came to preparing to be as good as he could be, but he gave the impression of being, I don't give a damn, you know, I'll kind of go through this stuff and so on. So you're talking about different personalities. But, but essentially, uh, he developed a sprint drill system. And for him, there were six parts to it. I modified it when I used it for five. But it essentially, it started out posture and high knees, and then it and arms, and and oh God, let me think now. Uh, I'm going to have to remember what those are now. Well, let's see, second, third. Uh, and, 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 and all these guys, as goofy as some of them were, when it came to paying attention to the drill system, 
Bayless. I remember John Carlos came there running like this, and all of a sudden he's taller. His body parts and energies are going in a straight line, and that's what Bud did to help John. John had enough sense to listen to him uh, in that regard. You would have had to have been there to observe how all this fit together with these personalities. But uh, those six parts were emphasis basically on posture, good arm action, and and the the interval was about uh, 35 yards. Mm -hmm. And you'd start, you'd go up on your toes, mm -hmm. be vertical, lean forward, which is in keeping your hips in alignment and sustaining that through the 40 yards. Running about half speed, not fast. Uh, uh, the second one, uh, as I re recalled, is uh, that was high up on your toes. Try to land right on the top of your toes to get ankle activity. A lot of kids would run, particularly the young kids, when you're working camps and so on. They they wouldn't use their ankles properly, and obviously that's a, a, a big. Yeah, was it really toes or the ball of the foot? Well, you, like the, you're, you're not landing yeah. on top, but you're trying to land right. as far, far forward on the ball of the foot. That's right. the idea. You just say high toes, and, and that's know. kind of a misnomer. It's, it's not exactly what's happening. And and then the, uh, uh, let me think. He put in the four-leg reach as part of it. Uh, I felt the foot should come down directly into the knee, not beyond it, because that comes as a blockage. It's yeah. not the same. And you can talk to the Jamaicans, you can, uh, there's uh, some it's pretty good people out there that have analyzed this under stuff. Under the knee. Yeah. Under the knee. Yeah. Because you watch all of Bud Sprinters, they dropped the foot directly into the knee. They all did. And they all had the high back kick and the high knees because of the high back kick. So the extension up and then through with the high yeah. knees. Uh, the, the last two were acceleration drills. Uh, it was kind of a lift and then accelerate. You'd, you'd start off a, a little slower than half speed, posture, arm action, everything, head in position, and then accelerate. Accelerate by sustaining your lean, accelerating, always arm speed controls leg speed. That's how you uh, anticipate it. And then the last one, uh, the, the, the next one, I don't know if it was fourth or the fifth, was uh, uh, three-point acceleration. Start off, go about 10 meters, accelerate, 10 meters, accelerate, through. Just to get the idea of thinking about uh, uh, the, the arm speed and accelerating while maintaining your tall forward posture. Uh, the last one was relaxation. We put a little bit of pressure here. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people start doing this, what, and, and that's, uh, my kids at USC were doing that. Yeah. And I said, basically, you can be tight doing this as well. And and the, and, the, and I think I learned this from Bud. I, I assume I did. If not, I'll put it down. Just put a little pressure here. You don't want the wrist to break because you're losing you're, you're losing drive is to put a little pressure here and fold these in comfortably yeah. mm -hmm. and have the palms facing each yeah, other. I remember yeah, that. yeah, that's, yeah. That's yeah. And, and have a little tension, have a little bit of tension there. Because essentially, jumping and running, uh, you have the foot that's on the ground, and if you stand on a scale, uh, it'll register so much weight. If you take and drive your knee up, there's more. It'll it'll go up. If you take your arms, like in the triple jump, mm -hmm. uh, so you have foot that's on the ground and free limb action. So sprinting and jumping are the same things in that regard. Putting the people who put more energy in the ground and it comes back out, the faster you're going to run, right. essentially. So those drills emphasizing those elements and go through it every day as part of the warm up after after the jogging stretching and so on as a group as, uh, as a group he'd have him go two at a time and if he had 10 people out there there would be 10 rows of two or if he had 15 he might use uh, five rows of three so he could watch and analyze and make comments and uh, I did this with my uh, PE classes mm -hmm. just to observe 
people running all over and at the end of the semester all of a sudden they're taller their hips are under them right. uh, and they're they're running with good mechanics so and that I, I learned that from bud so that that was a, and the one thing in training he did even for the 400 meters is he never ran further than 352 that's exactly yeah and that is a tough one uh, if you're looking at 400 meter training i don't he, do you know the name jim bush you know yes jim, of course yeah, yeah ucla yeah i have he jim helped me one year and then he was the sc coach after i left for a year uh he is really good on the 400 meters if you wanted to talk to him a little bit about some evenness and bud did the same thing is terms of training 400 meter people to learn to run even 110s or 100 meters and uh, uh and, and you notice that the, the baylor coach does the same yes, thing quite hard. Uh, they all run the strong part of their race is the third 100 meters and that's a jim bush thing too so and and yet bud thought he, he, he thought, I don't know where he came up with exactly 352. I think he wanted to add 10 seconds to that to get what you could run at 400 meters. But, uh, you know, that that's a little bit of a but. Lee Evans couldn't train off of that. He had to do longer sustained runs. And when they ran that world record time, mm -hmm. uh, Tommy was in better sprint shape. Uh, Lee had just started doing the sprint work. And uh, and that's when Tommy broke the yard record, and right. Lee was second. But the, and and then later on that summer. But uh, any I, I don't know what comments that, that have been made by Lee. But he says, you know, he said I I was I wasn't afraid of anybody. I figured I could beat anybody except one person, and that was Tommy. He he, he didn't think he could beat Tommy. Now I don't know whether that's usable or if you've talked to him about it, but well, I know he and I've talked quite a bit about it. Yeah, I know Aliator very well, so I, I talked with him. Uh, I think it's, um, it's great to have such a, a big, diverse group of athletes. Oh, uh, I'm sure there's yeah. personality clashes, and and they were, and, and but he also had the females work out too, yeah. which is unheard of back then to have the females. The yeah, some group. of them did. There, there were a couple. There was a, a couple of little young gals. It wasn't as that diverse. There were just a couple. couple okay. And and I think part of it is the little gals just like being part of the group. I think right. as much as anything else. Yeah. And then, the, so it was, it was always a group session. Everyone. Uh, yeah, when he could, uh, it, it was a little bit like uh, Lee in the fall would run, come over, and run cross country mm -hmm. occasionally. He'd br he'd break up, and then he'd come back and fit in with. Bud. But here's another little story. Uh, Bud can't tell this, but Lee told this to me, and so did uh, Bud. Bud went down to the Olympics when and Lee getting ready to warm up. Uh, he was out there, and uh, uh, I don't know whether he asked Bud or he says, you know, Bud, I'm going to, you know, go through the drill system. Just, just kind of, and he's going in to run the finals in the Olympic Games, and he, that little checkout, just those little six drills. He thought it was important enough to do. That. So uh, there were parts of Bud that were actually funny, and he's a little corny. But when it got down to, you know, what, he, who knew what the hell he was doing? It was Bud. It was right. Very much that. Well, that was one of the other questions we had. Like, yeah. like what was Bud like really like? Um, like, did he ever talk about his parents? Did he ever talk about his mentors, other coaches? Like, did he ever talk about his time at Cal? Like, I know uh, I always talk about my old time, yeah. my old people. I don't know whether he did to other people, but Bud and I stayed good friends till the day he died and he always supported me at san jose you know if he had uh, you know i occasionally i'd come out and say you know you watch some things here did you see something he had never criticized he never said a word but occasionally i'd ask him he says well you know you might check this and so on and and i appreciated that and he was helpful in me getting the usc job uh, and then uh, you know how he died. Of course, he was down to be inducted. Right. And has a heart attack after playing handball. But uh, 
No, but Bud, as a younger guy, was not easy on assistant coaches. Is I, I don't know whether you've researched it, mm-hmm. but in the last before I got there, there was almost a coach a year that worked with him. He was a very demanding guy. But I think by the time I got to him, with all the other political problem, all the other stuff going on, uh, he he was looking and and. You know, my my whole commitment was to help him and the team because I'd never been an assistant coach, so that was a new experience for me. But uh, and what year was that that you joined? Just, I I came in the fall of '68. Yeah, okay. I was in the summer. I was I wasn't paid. I got a job working for Ford Motor Company out here in Fremont. It's not Ford okay. now; it's another company. But because uh, uh, I couldn't go on salary until. Uh, September, but for recruiting and so on, he had to have me there. So that's that's how that all worked out. Oh, excellent. But he must have had some nuances. He must have tried like some of his experiments. You have to try it on someone. If there's a new drill, a new, yeah. a new uh, oh, he he, must, he have was to constantly, constantly that. Yeah. Uh, he his whole deal was the a golf mm-hmm. a, a, a golf club mm-hmm. and the golf head and the ball strike and God he had all this stuff and he right. went to this golf club I don't know what he ever did with it but he was a tinkerer that was fun right. okay. much that well here's uh, another topic of controversy I know you like yeah. this controversy stuff um, oh. today sprinters Not, yeah. reach top speed at say 60 meters, yeah. maybe 7 meters, like yeah. Tyson Gay and Usain Bolt. In one of the races, I think when Tommy broke the record, or one of his records, um, Bud went on record to Sports Illustrated saying that Tommy was still accelerating, and that Tommy was one of the few athletes that, could, that doesn't slow down at the top yeah. speed. What do you think about that? Everyone slows down. Uh, uh, I think within the idea of proportion, everyone reaches somewhere between 60 and 65 meters and because I had a grandson that was trying to excel I said you can't accelerate 100 yards get out 60 meters check out relaxation faster looser try to keep keep your rhythm and it's those who slow down the least win and that I don't think that's disputable here's where Bud got that and and this is my opinion what he did in Tommy's and and uh, uh, Lee's lane, he swept the lanes clean, and he could see their prints, and he saw at the end his strides were longer. So he assumed, I think, I, I maybe I'm, I can't speak for Bud, and Bud can't defend himself, but I, I think probably obviously his his uh, uh, his, his running rhythm slowed down. He, uh, that's what I think. Now, whether he, and, uh, because it's again those two variables. I think he was looking at stride length, not stride frequency. Right. Now, having said that, there is a film of the race. Somebody digitized the race. They could probably. Oh, there you go. Yeah, There's yeah. your project. Well, I think I think yeah. it's a it's an illusion. What happens yeah. is that all the other athletes are slowing down oh, after 60. Oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, and 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 while Tommy maintains his speed, it appears that he's actually pulling away. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and, and, yeah. yeah. that's true. That's good. That, I would. I, that would be. Again, with all the film that's out there, mm-hmm. you know, somebody with maybe your technical background, you could you could digitize digitize the whole race. Oh, definitely. We're we're looking at all angles. Yeah. And, uh, this is great. Um, can you talk more about Bud's uh, approach to relaxation and, and to visualize? Like he was really big. He wrote a, a best-selling book called "Relax and Win." Oh yeah. In '81, yeah. it was a top seller in Japan for the longest time, yeah. believe it or not. And um, we we know a bit of his history with the war. But can you tell me more about how he used that in practice every day? Uh, well, first of all, Bud is a person. You'd go out to dinner. I'm divorced now, but my then wife, who he adored. Uh, we uh, when Bud after Bud's wife had died, we'd go to dinner, and, and on the way home, uh, he'd get in the back seat. In two minutes, he'd be asleep. Sleep until he got home, then he'd be ready to go. Uh, he had that way of relaxing. He, 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 when when you were around Bud, uh, he gave you high blood pressure. 
he didn't have high blood because he was constantly like this. But when he turned it off, boy, he turned it off. And the whole idea is, uh, the term is relaxed tension. If you had no tension in your body, you'd be a pile of flesh. But uh, the idea that you have to... Uh, you have what is called, what I would call, relaxed tension. I don't know whether he used that word or not. I, I'm, I'm, when you get old, Jimson, you yeah. kind of forget what Bud and what I did. But uh, I would say relaxed tension. But the idea of, uh, you know, again, those who slow down the least win. Well, there's a new Jamaican, yeah. uh, Johan Blake. Yeah. He ran 19.26. Uh, now, is that the second sprinter that won the 100 meters? Yes, he won the 100. Yeah. Bolt fall started. Yeah. He ran 19.26. Oh, yeah. uh, a straight final in- invitational race. Yeah. He didn't go through the rounds. Yeah. Um, he had a horrible reaction time, like 0.269. Yeah. Um, and I think he ran that time because he, he was so relaxed. He wasn't thinking about a world record. He was thinking about the guy in front of him, Walter yeah. Dix, USA, yeah. oh, in front yeah. of him. Yeah. And he was just thinking about trying to catch him and staying relaxed. Yeah. And he was so relaxed, crosses the line, and he sees 19.26, yeah. like missing the record by 0.07. Oh, yeah. so, so I'm sure there's a lot of truth in relaxation. Oh, no question about that. And, and relaxation, as you know, is physical and mental. You know, you can, you can line eight guys up and run a hundred you can run ten hundred meters and the outcome will always be close but the same people seem to win not always there's a you know there's a variable no. there, but, but uh, there are some people who win close races and those who don't oh, yeah. and Lee Evans was one of the great competitors of all time I believe in the 400 and any all sprints at the end of the day after all the training after after four rounds of races yeah. or three rounds when you tell the line the one who wins is the one who has it up here in the head the one who has it together that's pretty much i think athletics uh, there are a lot of physical athletes out there that are off the chart those that can stay focused whether it's track or football no it's uh, it's a good observation yeah. how, about, how about recruiting i read another sports illustrated article from the archives everything's online now it's wonderful and some of the other coaches uh, were jealous about uh, how Bud claims he didn't recruit anybody, but it was <laughs> recruiting. I mean, it's, well, it's like, uh, can we he, talk about that? Yeah. See, uh, Bud, before I got to San Jose, first of all, I was the coach at Mesa Community College. We had just won the national championship and they were trying to hire a black coach. And they tried to get Rayford Johnson and some others. And Bud called me first part of the summer. We had a javelin thrower, Mark Merrill, that it was the first 300-foot throw. Michael Frey, do you remember in the, in the race where Tommy won the Olympic gold medal? Mm-hmm. Mike was in lane one. He was a junior. He was my athlete from Mason. Huh. And when he drew lane one, he would psyched because... Uh, he had run 20 point, 20 point one earlier that year. He was a pretty good athlete. But anyway, the point I was, what was the point I was trying to make? Uh, the recruiter. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, and I'm getting around to that. Uh, I'd always heard that you know, Bud said, "Oh, full scholarship, don't worry, you're going to live here and there, and kids would get there." And it was not those things; it was this and that. And I'd, he'd recruit all these guys, and half of them would go home, but half of them would stay. And and he kind of. And before I got to know Bud, uh, and when he asked me to go up there, I I. Um, I had had an unhappy experience with my athletic director, cutting away some of my out-of-state money. And I uh, uh, Bud called, and I think I was probably the best of the non-black prospects. Cause no, uh, and he said, are you still interested in the job? And I said, sure. I said, I'll take it. I'm, I'm ready. He said, well, you at least want to come up and look around. I said, I'll do that, but I'll take it. So I, I went up there. and. I, I got in and I watched and see, saw how Bud operates. Bud had, he's the ultimate optimist. Everything was going to be great. 
you're going to eat your meals here. I've got that worked out at this restaurant. You can't do that today. It's illegal. Right. But in those days, nobody kept track of that stuff. And, and Bud always looked at things through rose-colored glasses. And he really, he, he didn't think he was deceiving anybody. That's the way it's going to be. And like a lot of reality, it may be a little less than that once in a while. And, and that was it. But uh, he, he recruited hard. And he had some good assistant coaches. Okay. Before me, the people there, they, there were some, well, Ted Banks won the championships in El Paso. Ted and I had coached against each other. Tom Telez? Mm-hmm, yes. When I was at Orange Coast College in the middle 60s, Tom was at Fullerton. Ted Banks was at uh, Pasadena. So we all came up through that same little system. But uh, uh, Bud was lucky to have a, a second coach that was outstanding. Uh, I'll say I was the first exception. But uh, Ted Banks was a hell of a recruiter. I mean, Ted was good. And, and Bud, uh, like I say, the, the bases that had to be covered on recruiter, he covered them. And, and in general, people wanted to come there. But they found out that, uh, let's put it this way, nobody in the history of the sport did more for college track with less than he did. Nobody. Yes. Not even close. Yeah, there are several articles about that. Yeah. How he no, thought he why was, was so little. Oh, he was, uh, he was a legend. But with me, Bud, uh, he, he was very patient. Mm-hmm. What happened is he says, well, I'll coach this guy. And that my specialty is a pole vault. I've coached him eight people have jumped 18 three or higher and of course we had Chris Papanek and he said well I'll coach Chris because he's uh, temperamental I said bud tell me what you want me to do and I'll coach it so he gave me the shot and some of the field events and John Powell uh, and he had of course worked with these guys but he was so in, you're talking about practice for the sprinters right. trying to keep track of those guys down here what happened is he ended up getting caught up down there and I'd end up kind of covering where he wasn't let's put it that way right. it was kind of a strange year a little different but we got through it and they won a national championship the only one San Jose's ever won and the only one they ever will win and you know Fresno State, which is is kind of a hub of track in California, of, for, you know, for, for that level of competition, and they've dropped track. Mm-hmm. So it's it lost, it's it's there's no money at the gate. That's the problem. Yeah, and that's and no TV revenue. Un- unfortunately, money is. Uh, that's why I'm glad I'm getting old. I I have enough retirement. But money is not the most important thing to me. What is important is the lack of money. If you don't have enough money, that's a problem. But money money's not that important to me. Yeah. But getting back to Bud, uh, he was he gave you the impression he was really disorganized, but it wasn't. He had his little file system cards, he'd write notes mm-hmm. and and while he was gone I went through the decks and so on. He had his little uh, his system. Like like John Wooden had his system. Yeah, yeah. No, he uh, and he was good at going around to kids and talking to them and patting them on the back. He he kept track of things. And and Bud was he was good. Uh, was a good javelin coach. He was a good uh, uh, for a non pole vaulter. He was a good vault coach, but pole vault's a little different than some. I was a that was my event. Right. Yeah. So that that made a difference. But discus, he was very good. Kid, uh, I all like Bud. Was very pleased with him. Right. We're in good shape. Okay, right, thanks. Right I know um, there's a uh, one surviving film out there. Uh, it's made by Dr. Frank Ryan, and it's called Sprinting with Bud Winter, uh, San Jose State University. Uh-huh. Uh, it's on the website, and yeah. you can actually get a copy of it. And we put it up for free. It's a 15-minute clip. Uh, we didn't make any money on it. And, uh-huh. and so if ever you're curious to see, just go to yeah. budwinter.com and go to videos, and you'll see yeah. you'll actually see uh, him in action. And you see all this. Yeah. And there's also a French documentary on, on French TV, France TV, uh, about the Tommy Smith story. And there's a lot of talk with Bud and Tommy and Lee. Unfortunately, they they over or dubbed the sound, yeah. so you can't hear Bud or Tommy speaking. So those are the only two yeah. videos that exist. I know about Winter. 
and, and, and very little. Who did that, do you know? Uh, fr uh, the French TV station. Uh, I have it at home somewhere. Uh, uh, jot this name down. Patrice Ragney. Patrice. R-A-G-N-A-Y-E-Y. R-A-G-N-I. Ragney. Oh, okay. I... Okay. Because he was constantly with me, and of course okay. I, I'm kind of a Francophile, so I, yes. he and I spent a lot of time. He went over this stuff with Lee, mm -hmm. all this. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious to see if he's tied into that film. Possible. I have it at home. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'll take it out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll get, get you a copy if I can get that. Yeah. I guess. Um, yeah. I guess the last question I had, John, was, uh, what did Bud tell you? Like just to the coaches that work with him, yeah. Outside of the athletes, was there anything that he shared with you that he didn't share with the kids or? Well, yeah, sessions, I, I, he, sessions? he was a. I don't know whether it was a saxophone or so. He played in a band. That's right. He was right, in college. Right. I don't know whether it was a sax. Okay. He went to Cal. He never said much about that. He used to bring to some of the banquets. Uh, Oh, Hal Davis, a sprinter yes. from uh, Hardnell. Mm -hmm. Christ, Hal looked 20 years older than Bud at the banquet. And I think Hal lived, I, I think he lived longer than Bud. Bud died when he was 76, which kind of scares the hell out of me because I'm 74 now. <laughs> and I, I, I hope I can make it more than two years. But uh, what happened with Bud a little bit is that uh, he... First of all, he was a hell of a bad big player. He had a good, quick wrist. Mm -hmm. He played the games. And there are a lot of the PE people there uh, at San Jose State. And, uh, boy, they'd go in there at lunchtime, and it was competitive. Walt uh, McPherson, some mm -hmm. of those old guys. I, I liked San Jose State. It was a good job for me. I had a lot of fun. You were there for how many years? 16. 16 years. It's a long time to be anywhere. Well, I've never had a job longer than five years. <laughs> yeah, well, you're still, how old are you? I'm 48. Okay, well, you're Turning 50. a little younger. My son's 53, and I have a daughter that's a couple of years younger than you are. I'm, uh, I'm still running, trying to run. Yeah. Well, the whole master's track circuit well, is all new If life. you enjoy it. Hell, I'm lucky to get out of bed. I remember Vern Wolf, the track coach at USC, I took his place. He was do it in the master's pole vault and I, I'm 74 now I can't I, I'm, I'm lucky to ride a stationary bike I, I was a big time jogger I'd run a couple of marathons mm -hmm. as a jogger not as a runner I had no talent I just did it for exercise but I can't even imagine doing that but you can uh, know you, you, you run the sprints uh, I was when I was 40 I was running to 400 uh -huh. in about 52 seconds All right. I ran okay. 48 open and then I had four years, <laughs> from 29 years old to yeah, 40. Yeah. The attrition is four yeah. seconds. So I was running 52 at age 40. And every five years, yeah. you slow down two seconds. Is that the so way it works? That's the way it works, you, yeah. See, you're going to be an expert on all this. You can well, just, just, uh, you can just uh, develop a... Uh, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? A, a memoir. Well, I do. You it's can, on my blog. My, my blog okay, is like 1,400 <laughs> articles. I write five days a week, and I yeah. share all my experiences. And, yeah. and, and, and I, 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 Go ahead. I had, I had a couple of things I wanted to ask sure. you. I'll turn, I'll turn off now. Yeah. I, I think we're done with Bud Winter. Okay, well, fine. No, no,